I'm Dirk Holmans, your host and co-president of the foundation and director of OIKOS, the Flemish Green Think Tank. As we learned during the previous sessions, people from all over Europe are following, and that's great. You can put your questions uh, on Facebook, or you can also use Twitter to put your questions. And I see them on the screen, and then I will, uh, in the second half of our session, we will deal with them. The topic today is uh, feminist issues and women's challenges within the current COVID-19 crisis. But we also want to shed a light on how feminist policies can contribute to a green post-corona world. It is clear that feminist issues are coming to the forefront of public discourse across Europe in the current crisis. If we look at the people doing care work who are currently on the front line, and so most exposed to the infectious disease, the majority of them are women. Think about nurses, nurse aides, teachers, childcare workers, aged care workers, and cleaners. This means we have to think about gender sensitive responses for the gendered impact of this pandemic. At the same time, sadly, there's an increase in domestic violence. And next, multiple countries are using the current situation for yet another backlash against gender rights. In order to discuss this wide range of issues, we have today three inspiring speakers. First, we have Malgorzata Trax, member of the Polish Parliament for the Greens. Second, Laura Lopez, member of the Spanish Congress for uh, Podemos en Commun. And third, Joanna Macy, Secretary General of the, Women's, of the European Women's Lobby. We first give the floor to Margot Zata to talk about the situation in Poland. We all saw the black protests in Poland in the news, as the Polish government is again attempting to restrict sexual and reproductive rights. So let's start with that, uh, Margot Zata. If you please elaborate on what's happened, what is happening, what are the latest developments in your country? Yeah, I have this uh, news that um, in Poland two weeks ago, we had another, let's say, wave of black protest, but it's very difficult in pandemic times when people are locked, locked at, at homes uh, and they cannot go on the streets. Uh, in the parliament two weeks ago, the, the Polish parliament proceeded the, uh, the abortion ban bill uh, that was like a civil, um, civil, uh, civil initiative. Uh, so somehow the government had to proceed this project. It was like a certain time to proceed this project, but the way that they did it uh, in the time of pandemia and um, limited uh, civic rights, so women couldn't go to the protest was very significant. Um, what happened? Uh, the, the black protest or Ogólnopolski strike kobiet, like the one of the movements of the of the feminism and one of the uh, movement of the women's rights in Poland, uh, they tried to organize a lot of activities online. So um, as we all right now on Facebook, in social media, trying to uh, contact people, uh, that was also like a big uh, big action in in the social media, but also uh, women found some ways to uh, show that they don't agree on the abortion uh, ban in Poland. For example, we had like a car protest, so they were uh, people, one person uh, in a car and uh, all the cars, for example, were by the parliament, outside the parliament. Uh, they were also women and men as well, standing in line, um, just uh, just next to the parliament, uh, like with a face mask, yeah, as we as we needed, uh, with uh, with a, there was like two meter distance between them between them, and uh, it was very very unfortunate, yeah. That that was the civic project, and of course our uh, our parliament, which is mostly dominated by law and justice, the ruling party. And they are also far right other movements and and politicians there. 
they voted the project to proceed to the parliamentary commission and uh, there's a question what would be next because uh, the same project uh, was in the agenda of the parliament a few years ago and it was similar uh, similar situation that the parliament voted to move the project into the parliamentary commission and then for a few years no one touched the project yeah so as we as we call it it was just frozen in the co in the commission However, nowadays uh, our government is secretly using the time of pandemic to introduce a lot of changes in the in the public uh, life. Uh, for example, we today we have a parliament. We will debate for the third program uh, to help people that lost uh, that lost jobs, and it's not sufficient. And each time in this kind of uh, programs. They trying to uh, put some illegal issues. For example, they they introduced the postal voting that way. So we see that law and justice is really using this pandemic time to fight with all the groups that are against them. Uh, we will look at the situation. There's a motto of this feminist movement saying like we cannot be sure that this uh, this project will just be frozen in the commission and we have to be ready monitor the situation and show all the time that we're ready and we will not agree uh, to abortion ban in poland okay thank you you spoke about the third uh wave of new measures of the government. Uh, maybe you can explain to us what other measures they are trying to introduce or introducing that are restricting the rights of uh, Polish people. Uh, they are also like mostly we have the biggest problem in Poland right now that the let's say legal time of the presidential election it's uh, 10th of May. Uh, it's obvious that when the schools are closed, when people stay at home, uh, they cannot. Uh, we even have, for example, forests closed. Yeah, for for uh, for a few weeks. Right now they are open, but with all these restrictions and with all the danger uh, made by the coronavirus, having the election, presidential election in Poland is just impossible. Uh, they, they are not democratic, uh, mostly because there's no way to actually have a presidential campaign for the candidates. The ruling president, that it's law and justice, he's, uh, he's using the time of the coronavirus as an acting president to have the uh, presidential campaign, but other candidates are in the totally different situation. So there was the idea of the government that the election has to be on the 10th of May, uh, and and they tried to open the gate through one of these like helping programs, they are called shields, uh, to introduce postal voting. Then they went even further because they right now uh, the, the parliament is debating on uh, on the postal voting, like only postal voting for the 10th of May. Uh, we um, it was um, it was proceed in uh, in the parliament. And now the senate senate is taking care of it. Uh, we know that there will be a lot of amendments to this project, and uh, we'll do as an opposition everything to stop this uh, crazy presidential election uh, in May. Uh, we actually don't really know what will happen because everything um, will go back to the parliament of seventh uh, of May. And then it depends if the opposition uh, will be able to uh, actually uh, dismiss this project or change this project. Uh, right now, as an opposition, we don't have the majority in the parliament, but uh, there are some MPs uh, from law and justice or from like the club law and justice that are against this election and they might vote uh, like like us, like opposition, but we still cannot be sure of, of these actions. Uh, there's also a possibility because by using one of the shields, so this bills to help people, but uh, with like restricting also the, the other the other issues, uh, they introduced the law that the chairwoman of the parliament uh, might decide that the election might be in the different date. 
Uh, it's like against the Polish constitution because the election should be in the certain date and we should have like extraordinary state in Poland, the state of pandemic uh, as we are right now, but the government is refusing to introduce it. So everything what the, what the government is doing is like trying to win the election in the unfair campaign uh, and also risking the ha health and, and life of, of Polish citizens. Okay, uh, talking about the health of Polish citizens, you are in contact with a lot of feminist movements and as I said, and it will be the case in most countries, most of the health uh, workers are women. What do the feminist movements, what do women tell you about the situation at the hospitals, at care centers for children or uh, aged people? Uh, the situation is very difficult. Uh, our health system is not ready for fighting with pandemic. We don't have enough doctors, we don't have enough nurses. Mostly the, the age of the Polish nurse is above 50 years old. Uh, of course, there's not, not enough staff and as in the feminine, feminine um, occupation, quite often women are underpaid. So that's another issue. And right now we have a big problem with the care houses uh, because there's a lot of places in Poland when the nurses have to work for 20, 30 hours or even more hours without any break. Sometimes they don't see their families for days. Uh, there's also this always the danger that uh, there's not enough equipment. For example, the Polish medical service, nurses, doctors, uh, and, and the staff in hospitals or care houses, uh, they are not tested on the coronavirus. So they never know, they have contact with patients and they never know if uh, they are already uh, infected. And then it's also the this horrible feeling yeah, that at some point they go back to their homes, uh, to their families, children, and, and they have no knowledge. There's like not enough tests in Poland and we think as the opposition as Greens that the medical personnel should be the first, the first one to actually uh, be tested on coronavirus, but the government doesn't, um, doesn't see this need. Uh, so the situation of, of, of nurses is, is very, very bad. There's also the situation of women that um, had to resign from work to stay at home because the schools are closed, the nursing houses are closed. So uh, quite often in the Polish families, but I guess it's, it's, it's similar in all over the, the Poland that um, women earn uh, less than men. So when there's a choice, who of the two of the parents yeah, will, will have to take the days off to take care of the, of the kids, uh, it's quite often women, and as we know, then there's the whole way yeah, that they, they cannot uh, develop their career, for example, or even because it's quite common as well, the, the online online job. Uh, but it's also not the solution, because when the women stay at home with kids, they, they have to take care of kids and, of course, they have to still work and combining these both activities, responsibilities is not always easy. Thank you for this uh, sketch of the situation and uh, I, indeed I think in many countries it's the same situation and therefore I would uh, go now to Laura Lopez who uh, is in Spain which is we know besides Italy one of the most effective countries in Europe by the pandemic. So Laura could you uh, kindly give us an update on the current situation in your country and how this is affecti affecting non-male members of the Spanish society. Uh, I think you can hear me, or is it? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, yes, as you said, uh, Spain is a European country with the highest COVID-19 impact. And that uh, the government uh, declared uh, the pandemic on March 11, just uh, two days after the World Health Organization declared uh, the virus as a pandemic. Uh, then, as I just said, the measures taken by the government uh, from then on were similar to those taken by the rest of countries. 
and included a home confine confinement for most Spaniards. Although the measures have had a containment effect, they have a brought about collateral uh, social consequences. Um, and since the virus does not differentiate uh, territories uh, that understood, but its direct and indirect effects uh, do differentiate uh, degrees of vulnerability, social class, or, or gender, as, as you already said. So, Spain, uh, like other European countries has gone through a recent dictatorship that has marked the development of its democracy, its culture, and its welfare state. And as certain academic spheres have pointed out, we should not overlook the influence of the Catholic Church during the dictatorship. Family or marriage has long been considered the main or only relationship model and that has shaped gender roles that have been passed down from one generation to the other. And it has made it harder for women to gain ground in a male chauvinist society that has relegated us to a secondary and residual roles. Uh, today, uh, women are uh, almost completely integrated in the labor market, but we still present a lower employment rate compared to that of men. The number of uh, women uh, employed, uh, as you said, is uh, higher in caring uh, services uh, and the salaries are lower in some sectors because of the gender gap or because it is more difficult to us uh, to get the positions of resp responsibility. Um, moreover, we still have, uh, we, st we still have, be we still being victims of gender violence, uh, women, uh, you know, uh, we get killed just because we are women. Uh, 18 women has been killed so far this year, according to the official definition of gender violence. Only two, only two in confinement situation. Uh, but 36 uh, during cold year, according to the definition of feminicidios.net, which counts all women murdered by men. And there are still two in Spain, women who are sexually and exploited and who are victims of trafficking. With the lockdown situation and the suspension of the activity, as Queen Kofoat, uh, we have asked me, uh, so the suspension of the activity and the confinement situation have had differentiated social consequences for women because of their participation on, on the labor market and because of the changes in day-to-day -day life that uh, the confinement brought about. More than 76% of the people, uh, people employed in health services uh, are women. So it is only women that uh, who had to assist uh, directly uh, people uh, infected with the virus. Plus, especially since the measures for budgetary stability implemented uh, since 2012, public health services has been working under pressure, suffering severe cutdowns on resources and dealing with increasing privatizations. There were cutdowns on salaries and safety measures, and, and this affected mostly women. But not only are health and social services, as you said, clearly feminized, but also the service sector in general, especially supermarkets, which take a front line uh, on, on reeling, uh, a front line role uh, dealing with the COVID-19 crisis. So the activity to cover basic needs during lockdown has impacted differently on women and, and on men, since it is women who primarily take care of society uh, during the crisis. And not only the, the roles uh, taken by women or men, but also the consequences that women or men are, are suffering, especially in aspects of poverty, loneliness, the increased exposure, as also you say, to gender-related violence and other situations related, related to sex abuse or, or, or trafficking. Um, maybe uh, if you want, I can try to summarize for you some of the measures that the Spanish government has uh, taken during the crisis. 
Yes, yes, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, uh, the, the, the government, uh, according to the law, uh, the, we have a law, uh, of uh, 2011, uh, which allows the government to declare essential services in cases of emergency. This contingency plan uh, that uh, declared the government just after the declaration of the state of alarm uh, had declared all comprehensive services fighting against gender-related violence essential. All providers and operators uh, of assistance, uh, uh, services to women suffer, suffering gender-related violence must uh, remain available uh, by phone or online and be operative 24-7. Uh, then this contingency, contingency plan declared by the government uh, has also established an alert message service direct to the police and has been activated for women at risk, which includes geolocation as well as a chat-like communication service for psychological assistance. All these measures have been taken by the central government, but you know that the Spain uh, administration uh, is divided into 17 so-called autonomous communities, and, and so uh, each community has uh, their um, own local government. So a lot will depend, of course, on how well these local governments uh, implement the measures they are supposed to take. To start with the, and to ensure that contingency plan is put to work, the central government has required local governments to inform on what their phone and online uh, services are in their territories, as well as which are the face-to-face -face resources they count on so that the 016 line, the telephone which has been operating at the national level for some time to fight gender violence based violence can be conveniently updated and that victims calling are not derived to inexistent services in their areas, for example. Uh, in the period of uh, confinement, the calls to 016 and emails have increased considerably uh, if we compare to the same period last month. Uh, the central government has also took uh, another measures um, to fight uh, the vulnerability, vulnerability situations that had the women who are victims of sexual exploitation or traffic, uh, trafficking, as well as uh, against those in prostitution context, including a minimum income and housing uh, and support. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> um, you are also a member of the Gender Equality Committee at the Spanish Congress. Uh, how does the corona crisis affect the work of this committee? And what do you think are some of the most urgent actions needed to push in the coming weeks to protect women and girls better in this situation? Mm -hmm. In those days, uh, in this confinement situation, uh, most of the parliamenters uh, can't go to the Congress, but we're still working at home. So what we are doing is uh, two things. In, in one hand, uh, we are uh, making a following of the measures uh, that the government has, uh, has decided, as this one that I just explained to you, or the others to fight poverty or loneliness. For example, uh, my group is pressing to the government uh, in order uh, to take measures uh, to assure uh, a minimum income. Um, I think, and we are proposing that to the government, uh, that this minimum income uh, will help uh, women um, provided it meets four requirements. Um, because, uh, you know, uh, there are women uh, who are in cleansing works or maybe in care works that they even have a contract. So they need a, a minimum wage be be because other measures will not uh, give her um, an alibi of 
her poverty situations. So we are trying uh, uh, the commission that uh, this measure taken, well, it's not, not uh, taken yet, but uh, we are pressing uh, to it. And we think that uh, it could be a big measure is if the paperwork required to ask for it is simple, easy, and, and fast. The sum should allow people and, and women to meet the expenses to, um, of a dignified life. And the assignment of income must not replace universal public services. And that I think it's important. Uh, the wage uh, must be an individual assignment, not a family one, that it's the, the form that, uh, that they are um, talking to, to base. Because um, if it is family, uh, the, if the assignment is family, like it's the tradition in Spain, um, one may argue that families with children could get a higher wage and that would contribute to file child and poverty, certainly. But I think that it also brings a risk with it because if a woman leaves the home, she could lose the assignment. So I, I defend that the, the, this assignment must be individual. Uh, then we are in the commission uh, doing the following of the consequences that, that the already decided measure have. Um, we are looking at the papers uh, and we are really worried about some news that uh, say that there is uh, some sectors of masculine society. Concretely, uh, yesterday we were uh, preoccupied, worried about uh, a notice that said that there are some men who are who want to take advantage uh, about the, the situation of vulnerability of uh, some women that are in prostitution. And we're very worried about that and we want to take action in the Commission. Thank you. Uh, referring to the last point, uh, women in prostitution, you spoke about uh, a minimum income. How can the government make sure that also these women receive this minimum income? Uh, well, certainly, mm, the the law as this is now it requires that uh, this woman uh, have uh, meet uh, some requirements, and certainly this uh, can put uh, their risk because they not always meet these requirements. But in collaboration with uh, social workers and some ONG who are uh, working in that sectors. Uh, the um, girls in that situation can go there or, or, or by telephone or presential because they are ones that are still open and ask them to do the, the trimits for her. Okay. Thank you for this answer. We now go to the third speaker, Joanna Maycock. Joanna, as the Secretary General of the European Women Lobby, uh, I think you have a kind of broader overview from the perspective of the European level. And uh, I know your organization also wrote a briefing paper, which we will share uh, in the chat. Maybe you can also uh, elaborate on that. Yeah, thank you so much, Dirk. And thank you um, to the two previous speakers um, who really gave some uh, vital input about what's happening at national level when it comes to women and girls. Um, we at the European Women's Lobby have been working with our members, which are women's organisations throughout the European Union and a bit beyond, um, to really understand the impact of the pandemic on women and girls at national level, as well as to understand the uh, response by government and others at national level, uh, so that we can share and analyse the picture across, across Europe. So I'm going to share a few elements of that with you this evening. Um, and we have uh, a briefing paper that we produce, which has examples and analysis from across Europe. So that's going to be shared, as Dick said, on the Facebook page. The first thing I want to say, though, is that the crisis for women and girls in Europe is not a COVID crisis. It's a pre-existing crisis. We have stopped progressing on equality between women and men in Europe for the last decade. Um, and so we have we are already um, the, we are already um, second class citizens when it comes to experiencing our rights, whether that's around uh, poverty, whether it's around exclusion from the labour market, whether it's around the, the um, 
epidemic, the existing epidemic of violence against uh, women. And uh, Laura spoke there about both uh, the, the shocking statistics around murder, but also the huge numbers of women who are desperately exploited and girls who are desperately exploited in the sex industry and in prostitution. So we already have a problem. Uh, we already have a massive problem that we are working on uh, as an organization to, to raise the alarm on and to address. We bring into that uh, this current uh, situation of the pandemic, and there are, of course, issues which are then exacerbated, be they the issues of the economy, employment, care, uh, violence, decision making, so all of the aspects that we are already concerned about. And that's because our system is not made. Uh, for women. In fact, our system is not made for people at all. And um, since I'm in this group, the, the system is not made for the planet either. And so we, we look at the future and how we can actually uh, see uh, rays of hope about how we want to transform our system going forward to be really centered on human rights, on women's rights, on the rights of women and girls, on care for self, uh, for each other, for our communities and for the planet. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about some of the specific aspects uh, where, which we've seen across Europe, this crisis has exacerbated or has amplified or um, is other way, in other ways exposed. And the first one is the issue of care. Um, women are doing all the essential work or much of the essential work, the vast majority of the essential work that enables all of us to self-isolate. Um, to protect our health, to protect our societies. And actually, that's a continuation of what is already happening across our societies. Uh, the work that's unpaid, underpaid, unrecognized, undervalued that women are doing to care for children, to care for our health, to care for communities, uh, really as the backbone of our societies, to enable our societies to actually function, is too often un unpaid, or if it is paid, it's underpaid, undervalued. Very often, it's precarious work, so that means work which does not have proper social protection, proper contract, or decent employment conditions. I'm talking here about the work of childcare, of cleaning, of retail, um, of work, auxiliary work in hospitals. Um, and what that means is that those women are exposed to risks, uh, uh, both economic and, and physical risks. And in the current context, what we're seeing is that women are really shouldering and it's really become visible that women are shouldering the burden of caring for our societies and they're not being properly recognized or rewarded for that. More than 75% of health workers in Europe are women. Uh, the vast majority of those in the retail till sector, the huge majority of, of cleaners are uh, essential day to day uh, for, of childcare as well. And then when we talk about the actual situation of lockdown, the burden of domestic work and childcare in the home is also continuing to fall on women who are often also being uh, expected to try and hold down their job somehow while caring for children. And we know that, of course, there are men who participate in domestic work and in childcare, but we know the vast majority of that work is and continues to be done by, by women. So I want to say something about the precarious nature of the work um, and also the fact that women are shouldering a lot of the, um, the childcare and other domestic work. It's impacting on household decisions about who should perhaps work less, step out of work, take temporary unemployment where that's made available. And it's very often women that are, that are stepping out and therefore it's impacting their, um, their professional lives and their uh, also economic situation as well. Uh, when those women who are already in precarious work are also excluded from social protection measures. So an example one of our members gave was that the banks may be giving mortgage holidays. That's fine if you've got a mortgage and you own your own property. Uh, but actually, there are no such thing as rent holidays. And so those people who are really uh, in an in a already underpaid um, sector of the economy are not being supported by those social protection measures. So it's really interesting to hear from Laura that there are measures here to enable and support those women who are exploited in the sex industry and prostitution, who very often fall outside of those social protection measures. And we can only hope that if the state can do this to support women to escape from and live a decent life outside of sexual exploitation, 
during the crisis, that they can continue to do that afterwards, so that no woman should be exploited in prostitution in that in that sector in that in that in industry, which only serves to exploit. So the second thing I want to talk about then is about violence against women. We've heard examples across Europe of um, again, it's not a COVID crisis. It's a, it's a it's an existing existing crisis, um, but it's been amplified by the COVID uh, lockdown measures, for example. So we've been hearing stories across Europe of um, of the, the the support systems that are, that are often run by women's organisations. So these are helplines, they are uh, shelters that are specifically servicing and supporting uh, women victims of male violence. Uh, have already been uh, ravaged by cuts over the last uh, decade, uh, and now um, also seeing an increase in demand. Uh, by women who are facing situations of control, of, of coercion, of violence, of rape in their, in their own homes uh, as a result of the lockdown situation. So we've been gathering data and also making demands to make sure that these services are proper, properly um, supported and funded, that these services run by women's organisations that have a feminist perspective and understanding and pro can provide safe support for women and their, and their families when they are victims of male violence are properly supported. We've also heard good examples of, for example, pharmacies or other businesses who are able to receive, um, who are supported to receive complaints from women. So if women are unable to alert the services or make a phone call, for example, to a helpline because they're shut at home, but there are ways through, through for example, in France and in, um, in Spain, I think as well, where you can go to a pharmacy and actually the pharmacy will help you make that call. So there is access there. There are also examples in some countries like France of um, shelter services and support being provided by hotels, which are obviously not currently receiving many uh, other visitors. So there are examples of things that have been done during this crisis that we'd like to see more of in, in the future. But I want to stress the crisis of violence, male violence against women is already endemic in all of our societies, be that in all our workplaces, homes and streets. 50 five zero women are murdered every week in the European Union by a partner or ex-partner. And we are, and if that isn't a crisis, which it doesn't seem to be when you look at the political and financial response, then I don't know what is. So we need to make sure that, that if there's more attention to this issue right now, that that continues into the, the next phases. Um, then if I may, can I still have another cup, another minute or so, Dirk? Or have yeah, I no talked too long? Okay, go good. Um, there's so much to say about this. I think um, for us, we want to also mention the some of some specific situations. For example, we're very concerned about the situation of older women, uh, particularly those who are either in isolation or whose health is um, obviously more more at risk because of the virus. And the situation, I think, of care homes really comes into focus through this crisis. In Belgium, the majority of of deaths through the through the uh, Christ through the corona uh, disease have been in care homes. And I think that raises some, and the majority of the elderly, of course, are women. Uh, so I think it raises questions for, more broadly for society about what we mean by caring for older people and older people in our aging societies. Again, very often, the people who work in those care homes, again, like those who work also in the auxiliary services, cleaning services, and so on in hospitals, are very often migrant women, very often. Uh, minority women, uh, they are, so they're experiencing multiple discrimination. And I wanted in particular to talk about the situation of migration from East Europe, East of Europe to Western Europe. Um, um, Margot Zata might mention, might want to say something about this as well, but there are, of course, many women migrating into care jobs and cleaning jobs in Western Europe from Poland, from Romania, from Bulgaria. Um, often again, outside of social protection systems on very low incomes, working and in caring for our older people in care homes. Um, also leaving a care gap in Poland, Romania, etc., which is then filled by women coming from further east. Uh, so this is an ongoing situation which is not discussed enough, but I think is thrown into starker relief when people are in isolation and not able to cross borders either to return home uh, or, or to care for their own families. The second thing I wanted to mention was also women with disabilities, women and girls with disabilities, uh, who are also often um, more, depending on the disability, can be more exposed to the virus itself um, and uh, to its impact. 
the situation of uh, their care workers, often those care workers who come into their homes, also being very disrupted. Uh, there are many, many issues of concern, really, uh, um, in the long run about the um, about women with disabilities that they face already but within this specific area of COVID. So we want to say overall that women must not, women and girls must not pay the price for COVID. It's a pre-existing crisis. There are a series of measures that we would like to see put in place at European level um, that make sure that we seize this moment to really recognise care recognize the contribution of women, of all women, um, to our societies, to our well-being, and put care back at the center of our, of our economies and our societies. Care, is a, care for people and planet instead of profit. Um, and that means really rethinking our economic uh, model and our society. And I'd be happy to, we've got some more um, examples of what we'd like to see the European Union do, particularly in terms of integrating a feminist perspective in the financial response, in the political response, and in the injection of, um, of special resources uh, that are going to be managed by the European Investment Bank, for example, billions, trillions of euros, which are going to be stimulus packages. We need to make sure that those work for women. For now, up to now, and they simply haven't done. So I'd be happy to also take questions or speak a little bit about more about that uh, later, perhaps. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Uh, I think it's very important we come back to that later to really see if new policies are developed that, uh, as you said, it has to be policies that take care of women of the planet and with us the basic concepts. Uh, yeah, care. So we are receiving the first questions of people from all over Europe. Uh, Laura, I have a question for you. It's on the single parent households of which 80% of them are women, half of them with poverty. Uh, do you know the government in your country is planning to implement specific measures to uh, help these single parent households, these women? Government, it, it was um, working to introduce a kind of uh, minimum wage uh, that it uh, not that it wasn't only for uh, girls who are in a situation of prostitution or traffic or trafficking, uh, but it was uh, to all the the situations. So there, um, since I know, not a specific uh, measure for that uh, mothers uh, monopantering. Uh, but uh, I think uh, that it's a good measure that of the minimum wage because um, surely it will it would benefit it would be good for them. Okay, thanks. There is now also a question for Margot Zeta. Um, does the Polish Parliament work on regulation which could help women in lockdown suffering from domestic violence? Uh, yes, actually, today uh, we had the parliamentary session, plenary session, and that was one of the subjects. Uh, Poland ratified the Istanbul Convention like five years ago, but uh, since 2015 there was nothing done on the parliamentary level to actually introduce the, the, the law yeah, made by the convention. And today we worked on the government project that is actually very good and it's about uh, the real help for the victims of the home violence in the terms of separating them uh, from uh, from the people that hurt them uh, so it will give uh, home victim like the victims of the home violence the tools legal tools uh, to fight for uh, for their rights and to have a shelter proper proper shelter However, that's the law that we're working uh, right now. Yeah, it's like five years, uh, five years old, especially after the uh, policy of the Polish government that cut all the public finances for the women organizations. Uh, for example, we had uh, the Center of Women's Rights, uh, Centrum Praw Kobiet, that's a well-known in Poland organization that was helping women that uh, that were suffering from domestic violence and a few years ago the government just cut public found, uh, funding for them yeah and they were in every city or in many cities in poland they were doing like the real job the psychological help 
the, the uh, legal help, uh, the, the line, uh, telephone lines, uh, also finding the new places for, the, for women and, and children that experience violence. Uh, so it's a bit weird and uh, also especially that in the time of pandemics yeah it means that there's a lot of cases uh, right now when we are all in isolation when people are suffering uh, quite often at homes and we know there is there's more and more cases cases of the home violence uh, so uh, so far the government did nothing to introduce like a special law about helping people uh, that are isolated and, and suffer more. Uh, there is also no like extra phone call lines even for, for people that are looking for help. So I think uh, they are the issues that we should focus now that nothing in the days of pandemic when we should care about uh, about people that are victims of the home violence, we did nothing so far. Yeah. So we will have to work uh, work more to provide the help that is needed. Okay, thank you. So, Joanna, we return to you. We are eager to elaborate on the much needed policies by member states, by the European Commission. So, what are the core recommendations? Yeah, thank you very much. I um, wanted to say that uh, on the 4th of March, the European Commission issued a strategy for gender equality. And the 4th of March seems like a completely different age to today. Um, I think it was the last kind of event I went to before I entered into lockdown. But we had actually been five years at the EU level without a strategy, a political strategy for achieving equality between women and men. Which is absolutely mind blowing when you think about the fact that equality between women and men is one of the core values of the European Union and has actually been in the treaties since the Treaty of Rome, which had equal pay for work of equal value included in it. So, we are, which we are very far from having been having achieved. I'll maybe come to that in a second. But we had a, a, a strategy actually published on the 4th of March. So, one of the things we want to make sure is that that strategy doesn't get forgotten or pushed to the wayside, but actually is integrated into the response. So the strategy talks about the ratification of an implementation of the Istanbul Convention, really, really important, has been delayed um, in the Council for, for the, last, the last few years. And we, we know that countries, even countries that previously ratified it, such as Poland, have, have kind of retreated from it or not implemented it. So we think that it's absolutely essential um, that the overall strategy uh, is is not forgotten and actually that progress is made. So it looks at Istanbul Convention uh, and action for violence against women. It looks at issues like implementation of a better work-life balance. So again, things, issues around the care and the balancing of care between parents and between parents and wider society. Um, it also has uh, proposals for equal pay. So. Uh, there was supposed to be some legislative measures this year to in be introduced around pay transparency, so requiring companies and or employers to publish pay gaps. Uh, but we've recently heard that that is the, the first thing, one of the first things which has been removed from the work programme of the Commission this year. So we what we're saying, absolutely, this is not the time to remove that from the work programme. Right now is when we need action to understand what does equal pay work of equal value mean? Actually, what does equal value mean when we look at employment and we look at pay? And why is it that the work that women do, do um, in the sectors where women work are all are very often those that are the lowest paid? So we are concerned, so that we were concerned that things should not get delayed or pushed off the uh, off the table. So that's our first thing is let's implement that gender equality strategy really central to the gender equality strategy that the commission um in fact we would we would rather call it the strategy for equality between women and men as is the french uh, title because we think that's clearer about what the focus of this should be and that is actually the language of the eu treaties um we um also one of the really key things and the strong things in the strategy is to introduce a gender analysis and gender perspective in all of policy areas um, and that includes in the budget so, for example, the Green New Deal, which I'm sure the, the listeners and the Green European Foundation has been following really closely, 
um, will not work and cannot work if we do not consider the different impacts on women and men and if we don't integrate a gender perspective into the overall Green New Deal um, and into all the funding that comes from that. Uh, so this, these are things which are already suggested in the strategy, but we want to see and make sure that a gender perspective um, is really integrated into the COVID response, into the Green New Deal, into the digital transformation, etc. When I'm talking about the funding, it may, um, I don't know how familiar the people listening are with the concept of gender budgeting. But this is the idea of looking at budgets and understanding, based on sex disaggregated data, the different impact and the different uh, impact that uh, the funding and the resources will have on women and men. If we think about COVID response and we think about trillions of euros or certainly hundreds of billions of euros in, in loans, in stimulus packages, etc., if you invest that without thinking about the inequality and the different experiences, the existing inequalities between women and men, you're actually investing trillions of euros into an unequal system. So you're actually reinforcing the inequalities. It's not neutral and there's no such thing as neutrality. We want to make sure that there's a gender perspective into the, the European Union's multi-annual financial framework and into all of the stimulus, uh, into all of the stimulus packages. There was a, a study done last year by the European Institute for Gender Equality, which I highly recommend anybody who wants some statistics and studies on this stuff in Europe, have a look at that. Uh, looking at the cohesion funds of the European Union, which is a big chunk of the European Union budget, and is supposed to be precisely about addressing poverty, inequality and regional disparities. And less than 2% of the funding was going to, to advance gender equality. Less than 2%, not even 50%. So a long way from 50%. So this is a real, real challenge and a real uh, problem. So we want uh, ultimately to re really get to rethinking our economic system. Um, we saw we cannot let the EU repeat the past mistakes it made uh, as a re in the response to the financial crisis. I think everybody here would agree with me that austerity, which was a political choice and imposed and, and supported by the EU along with its friends in the IMF, etc., has been at, at utter failure, has been a complete disaster for Europe, politically, socially and economically. And most of the burden of that austerity has fallen on women's shoulders. As you strip away funding, uh, Mark Gorsha talked about the fact of stripping away funding for women's organisations, providing shelters and care uh, and support for domestic violence. But if you strip away the public sector, if you reduce the number of well-paid jobs in the public sector, if you reduce after school clubs, if you reduce childcare all of, or elder care, all of that falls on the shoulders of women who are pushed into more and more low-paid jobs and part-time jobs. More, so more than 75% of all the cuts in Europe in, under austerity came out of women's pockets and we were already the poorer. So we need to make sure we're not going to repeat that mistake again. We need a real investment. We need to really release resources to encourage governments and regions to invest in gender responsive quality public services that will help us really build the kind of society we want to build after this, where we're learning from this and we're learning from the past and setting foundations for a really much more, uh, a, much, a better society for everybody. Where care is really right at its heart and right at its center and not the, the, the race for profit and growth which is actually destroying our planet and destroying our health and our well-being and destroying uh, our lives and, and actually contributing to uh, inequality and intolerable inequality. I, I have many others, but I will, I will start yeah, just, there, uh, maybe there's some questions from, and let's let the other speak as well. But, uh, they came, uh, there was an interesting question here on the chat and maybe uh, all of three, all three of you can respond to it. The question is whether this is the right moment to push for a legal recognition of unpaid work. And could this policy come under the name of a universal basic income? So maybe first, Laura, what do you think about this proposal? Is there, do you hear me? Uh, yes, yes, but I just forgot. Oh. Uh, well, I, I just, uh, 
uh, answering if you are so kind oh, on paid work okay just i forgot what you asked about <laughs> sorry yes i i well, well here in spain it's partially recognized since uh, we have a special regime for that women or men who are on and by work uh, at, at home. And in there are special measures also in the time of uh, COVID-19 to assure that did uh, concretely or especially women did not uh, lose uh, their income in this period. But uh, there is a, uh, an attempt in Spain to recognize uh, unpaid work, uh, mostly do it by, by women, by women. Okay, maybe uh, on Grosette, Poland? Um, yeah, it's of course a problem, but I think it's also one issue that uh, that is worth mentioning. It's like a grain zone. Uh, for example, I don't. I guess it's similar in different countries as well, but for example, in Poland, if the, even if the government is pretending that wants to help a specific um, workers yeah for example artists or pe or people that lost their jobs uh, or or people that have no long term um, contracts i think the, the another issue uh, are the, like the people that have no contracts you know we know that the green zone exists uh, and no one can deny it and quite often they are uh, migrants as as joanna mentioned before quite often they are uh, women that just need extra money yeah? and they do the household jobs they offering they work uh, and right now when they uh, left without any source of income even if it was not uh, not, not uh, without tax yeah because it was not registered then there's no help from for them uh, from the government so maybe the the idea that uh, i think like going uh, maybe a little bit more uh, into like a green uh, ideas uh, of the guarantee basic income so uh, the money that everyone will get uh, without uh, like uh, the reason yeah like they should this basic income that everyone can uh, can share and it's provided for everyone especially in the term, uh, terms of in the times of pandemic. Uh, that's one of the concepts that we should think about. The, the concept is generally more and more popular, but uh, in the time, times like that, when people just lose their jobs from day to day, uh, it would be something to con consider. Okay, going back to, maybe one question, Marco Zata. Joanna, spoke about the situation of women uh, from Eastern Europe now working uh, in Western Europe in care centers or hospitals and that um, the empty places in Poland then are filled with women coming from other Eastern European countries. What about their situation? Uh, yeah, that's another topic. Uh, we have uh, in Poland a lot of Ukrainian workers of women and men and uh, honestly they they needed yeah before the pandemic they were job offers almost in every shop and and they were people needed to uh, to work uh, right now the situation you know it's more difficult to get the, the access to the permanent uh, stay in poland uh, even because of the prosaic reason that the, the offices are closed yeah the, in Poland, the courts or the, the uh, municipal institutions, they don't work as they used to do before for eight hours a day, but the times are limited. That means as well that uh, the time that we apply the documents and we wait for response, for example, if you can still uh, stay in Poland, uh, it, it just takes longer. Uh, there's also another issue, I think, connected with it. Uh, we have uh, right now a I mean, a lot of people in Poland uh, have a big problem because of the closed borders. Uh, uh, on the German-Polish border, there was a big movement yeah, of the workers. So people that uh, lived on the Polish side, they work on the German side. Uh, the same on the border of Polish and uh, Czech Republic. And right now, when the borders are closed, uh, 
the situation yeah of the people is is they, they just can they they just cannot work there's a lot of protests uh, going around it that uh, they they losing yeah they they source of income because they just cannot cross the border and that was not the situation when they take the uh, when they uh, took the job so i think that's also one of the issues that probably many countries in europe are uh, are experiencing and uh, it's nowadays it's normal yeah that in united europe let's say uh, it's possible to live in the different place than we work okay thank you <clears throat> there's another question uh, for you how do feminist groups stay mobilized in this time of physical isolation it's it's not easy but mostly social media when i mentioned that before the abortion ban uh, was uh, in the parliament the feminist movement organized a set of social media actions uh, i for example participated in one of it uh, that was just that was saturday just before easter and it was one day long i think like 12 hour long um, interview the leader of the strike of women, Marta Lempart, uh, she was like a host of the event and she invited a lot of feminist activists, also uh, MPs. Uh, each of us had like 15 minutes or half an hour to speak about the abortion bill, what we will do in the parliament, what's the way to protest, um, answering the rhetoric question, yeah, why do we have to fight abortion ban again and almost every two or three years in Poland? Uh, and I think it was a very unique event uh, with a lot of audience and it showed that even in the pandemic uh, times uh, we can still uh, resist somehow. Uh, also, for example, a lot of gadget of feminist movements, uh, they, they were t-shirts, yeah, and the leader of the strike of women delivered these t-shirts to parliament and asked us to wear them, yeah, as a sign of protest. So uh, even in the parliament, when we were processing the abortion ban, um, most of the opposition uh, opposition MPs, female MPs, were wearing black. That was like our, you know, sign of the black protest, the solidarity, yeah, like it was a few years ago. And some of us had also the the T-shirt with the logo of the strike of women. Uh, the, there was also, we had, uh, for example, in the previous years, two um, citizens' initiatives saving women. We were uh, collecting signatures to present the citizens' project in the parliament, and that was a liberalization of the abortion law. So we also had quite a lot of gadgets from, um, from these activities, where a lot, a lot of feminist movements were uh, were involved in, in 2016 and 17. Uh, so I think that was the solidarity yeah, that was shown, uh, sh shown, uh, showed, and uh, also by the parliament. Yeah? For example, the, I joined for a while to the women feminist or, or, or women standing on the streets. Uh, we were trying to support them. It, it wasn't that easy because um, you know, it was this this element of fear. The policeman car um, was standing on the street. It was like from George Orwell, uh, the signs that it's better for you to stop the demonstration. Remember to keep the distance. Um, uh, you should go home. And uh, it was kind of a very weird experience. But I'm I'm very grateful that there was quite a lot of uh, women that were supporting our fight in the parliament yeah and we were supporting their fight on the streets even in such a difficult conditions okay thank you uh lara in spain you have the same experience that now social media are very important to stay connected it is uh, but uh, social media and uh, conventional uh, paper. It's not rare to see in the newspapers different articles uh, aborting the post-coronavirus um, world or um, also the coronavirus uh, administration in a gender perspective uh, view and also, yes, in the social media, Twitter, Facebook and, and so on. 
But what it's uh, difficult to, to find, it's um, some voices uh, that relate the, the feminist perspective, or perspective, the gender perspective, uh, uh, with the green perspective. There are a lot of people uh, worry and working about uh, the issues that affect the women, and a lot of people uh, working on the issues that affect the, 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 the planet also uh, studying uh, and spreading the relation about our lack of um, or the lack of consciousness of, of uh, some sectors of the society about the necessity of uh, carrying the, the, the planet. But uh, there is a still um, a lack, uh, a kind of, of, of lack of connection between the green politics, the green voices and the feminist voices. And I, I think it's part of, of the same thing as it said uh, Joanna before. We have to put the, the, the care perspective, the gender perspective, uh, just in the center of our, our politics in, and care ourselves uh, and care our planet. Okay, I think this is um, the perfect moment to uh, return to you, Joanna. Uh, you, were, you really were already explaining how we could combine the care for women with the care for the planets. Uh, we have to uh, combine these perspectives in New Green Deal. So, um, yeah, what are your further ideas on this? Thank you. You might be able to hear some background noise because there's very enthusiastic eight o'clock clapping happening in my street every night. Uh, so all the neighbours are out clapping um, in respect for actually the people who are going out and doing essential work, most of whom are, are women. So you can you might be able to hear some background noise. My, my husband the is window for a moment. <laughs> enthusiastically joining in. <laughs> so um, yes, absolutely. And I think um, I think there's a lot of common ground, actually. And we've seen one thing that gives me a lot of hope is that we've seen over the last five years a huge uh, upswell, I think, of interest and awareness and activism around women's rights and feminism and also around climate change and, and combating climate change. And I think that there are many common threads in the in the in the two combats. What the main thing is that we want something transformational. We want something different to be to be coming next in terms of our economy and our society. Um, we know that our current system is failing the planet, it's failing people, it's failing women and girls. So we, we need something, we need imagination, we need action, um, and we need to really be able to build, put down foundations to build and renew our system. So I, I have a, a sort of allergy to the word um, recovery. From this, uh, I know it's really important when it comes to health, uh, but recovery from this, uh, from this particular uh, pandemic we do not want to go backwards, right? We do not want to go back to what we had before because it was already a crisis. It was already a crisis for women. It was already a crisis for most, for, uh, in terms of inequality, it was already a crisis for the, for the planet. So I think we can bring together some of our thinking, some of our power, some of our collective energy, uh, some of our, our power of those in parliaments, but also those in civil society in the streets. We've seen also the power of women leading environmental movements and, and climate change movements, including the young women here in Belgium and, and globally. Um, so we, we need to see a different kind of leadership, a feminist leadership that dares to imagine something different for the future, something that's actually built on the spirit and the values of care and equality and justice uh, and, and feminism. So some uh, and one thing I would say is to make it more concrete is that we cannot have a green new deal that ignores ignores women or that actually ends up being an investment in the inequality which exists already. That means making sure that the policies are designed with an understanding of who pays the price and who does the work is a simpler thing as if you want more recycling or if you need to use less and put and, and uh, consume less. What does that mean in terms of who's taking up the slack and the work, right? So you know that the recycling gets done, most of it gets organized by women, so it's like extra work that women have to do. So we need to think, like, how are we going to do this differently? And how are we going to create societies that enable everybody to participate in that care? Um, I wanted to come, if I may, uh, to the question of um, the basic income. That was mentioned. Yes, please. Because I know it's a very popular theme in the environmental movement, and we 
definitely feel that there's a need for balancing work life and what we would say is it's actually about making sure that people women and men can be equal earners and equal carers in a context where we are not all being pushed to burn out and overwork and long hours um, including and I, I insist on this not just those in professions but those also in the lower paid jobs who are having to do multiple contracts to, to survive. So it's all very well to think about a basic income, but if you do not do the gender analysis of how that will be impacting on the li lifetime earnings, well-being and income of women and men, it will disadvantage women. That I can be, we can assure you. So a basic income must, car, if it, if it, we would rather talk about a minimum income guarantee, so that everybody has a minimum income guarantee, and it has to also come with the provision of proper state funded services and public services. So it's fine if, if you have proper, well resourced uh, childcare, elder care, hospitals, uh, public transport, recycling, um, et cetera. And you have proper measures to really support working families, men and, and women. But if you just do a blunt basic income and you don't support it, with a proper shift in values and a transformation of the economy and the public services, what might end up happening and what will very likely end up happening is that women will end up, um, and my cat has joined, here she is, she's also a green feminist. Um, what will, will end up happening is that women may be pushed out of the labour market so that the well-paid jobs with good social protection, uh, good pensions will be reserved for men while women are increasingly pushed into the home to look after children and do the domestic chores without a decent pension at the end of it, without uh, the ability to invest in their, in their uh, careers as well. So we need to be very cautious about basic income if we're not considering the wider implications for women and men um, and our wider societies uh, of that. So let's be cautious about basic income. Uh, without let's, let's make sure we do the proper discussion about how it will impact and how it can be made to be feminist. So we rather talk about quality public services, laws that support working families, laws that enable also men to take part in caring, um, and a wider reflection about the kind of society we want to build where people are not having to work around the clock. And, and, and um, I wanted to mention here also the impact on mental health, which we haven't really mentioned here. In COVID, I think that's a big discussion, but in more generally, the levels of stress and anxiety that people are facing, and, and women and men, but, uh, women also having to balance too many things uh, on their shoulders. And I think that's something also that we need to consider more in, in our response, and is an issue, I think, for the environmental movement as well. Whether it's about anxiety about the planet, which we see a lot of anxiety amongst young people, um, or whether it is about um, how we how we deal with the the, the, the changes that are coming actually and that need to happen the positive changes that need to happen so i think yes the green and feminist agendas can be united but it means that we need to keep uh, discussing the the gendered impact and the environmental impact of the different policies that we are pursuing and asking for and campaigning for okay thank you very much joanna i think this is a key point uh, integrating feminist and, and green uh, perspectives and proposals, and I think it's already happening. There's a last uh, important point uh, made in some questions. It's about how can we enhance solidarity in Europe, uh, especially, of course, with people that are affected, people that are already living in a difficult situation. So I think this is also a question that's uh, very interesting to hear the response of all three of you. So maybe first, uh, Laura from uh, Spanish point of view, and I think there's also this uh, perspective from countries from the south and uh, reactions, reactions from countries like the Netherlands uh, on European solidarity. So what's your perspective on this? Uh, I think that it's necessary more Europe, uh, but maybe not a Europe as uh, someone want to make and have and they have made until now. Uh, we have, uh, we need uh, more uh, solidar uni uh, European Union in in all these uh, all the um, spheres. Uh, I mean, um, to fight against exploitation of the of the worker. So, 
not only for the response on the COVID and the uh, coronavirus and, and, and so that, but um, there are differences between countries that only can be uh, tackled if all the workers and of, of Europe, I, I want to save the world, but uh, this would be an, another thing. All the workers of uh, Europe are uh, united uh, because in a different situation, we cannot uh, gain our rights because uh, we gain our rights, uh, but other worker in uh, other country, it's uh, suffering the consequences of, of that. So I need uh, that we have to uh, strengthen uh, our uh, European Union and think together about the, the rights of the, of the workers about the right of uh, the, the of the women uh, all together because the situation in what country may be different from another country but maybe this last country can repeat the situation that the first country has gone through and 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 to tackle and it is i think is uh, one of the uh, one important thing uh the contamination in 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 the air uh before joanna said that uh, we had to think about the consequences that the different policies had on men or women or, or the consequences that the different policies have on the, on the environment. Well, I think that not only that, uh, I agree with Joanna, but I think that we have to think um, not only the consequences, but uh, we have to concrete the policies that we want to pursue. I mean, uh, maybe everybody can agree about that we need more feminist uh, policies, more solidarity in Europe, as the question what, uh, was about, uh, and more green policies. But I think that it's uh, necessary that we quantify these things. When we say that we want uh, more uh, policies in a gender perspective, what we are saying, uh, are, are, um, how many money uh, have the uh, state, the local governments, Europe has to put on this to concentrate people, uh, maybe to tackle some differences that uh, need uh, some amounts of, of money. If uh, When we are talking about uh, green policies, uh, the Green New Deal, um, green justice, what we are saying concretely, how many money, what we are going to do. And I think that uh, it could be very good uh, for women and for the planet that we reach an European agreement. and. And you'll complete committee. And when and we go all together with that. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Thank you. Um Marco Zetta, what's your take on the kind of increased European solidarity we need? Uh, I think that increasing the solidarity in Europe is actually the key to keep European Union going. There's no other way. We can see that always in the time of the crisis, and especially right now, far right movements or populist movements, sometimes uh, populist left movements, political parties, uh, they gain approval of the society yeah, with these strong uh, statements. And uh, they might use the times of coronavirus for uh, that uh, the situation. Yeah? We even know that Ursula von der Leyen apologized Italy for not helping on time when the help was uh, the most needed. And uh, the same voices I can hear, for example, in Poland from the far right movements, yeah, that Europe is not helping us in the times of crisis. We we, we, we're uh, receiving no help. So what's the point of being in European Union? Uh, and this bad uh, atmosphere about European Union uh, in, the, in many countries is growing. And the only response we can have is this European solidarity. Uh, also, I think that um, Green New Deal might be in danger because uh, now it's always this dilemma. Yeah, We have like a plan of Green New Deal. We as Greens, we think it's not ambitious enough on the European level. However, we in Poland think it would be great to have green European deal because our government doesn't even accept that, yeah, the, the, the European agreement. Uh, but right now, there, there are more voices of the politicians saying, like, we should forget uh, green new deal. 
uh, and we should focus on economy. So make exactly same mistakes and uh, as, as, as in the past, yeah, that always the climate has to wait. The transformation of the of our economies has to wait because there is a crisis and we have to uh, try to keep the economic model as usual. Yeah. So in, instead of thinking about how to change it, so it would be uh, better for people. It it would be based on the common goods, on on public services, on the community uh, working as a community more than just individual uh, profits. Uh, we might go as European Union back yeah, to, let's say, to the stage before even the idea of uh, Green New Deal. And um, I guess what's extremely important right now, and especially for us as Greens, um, is to decide to have the debate and make like a strong statement and the vision of the world after uh, after the coronavirus, yeah, when the pandemic will be all over the Europe, we should already have the response. How should uh, the world look like? We should also show that uh, Green New Deal or fighting uh, uh, climate catastrophe uh, is not a challenge, is a chance for us to change our economy, uh, to create new green jobs, uh, to create a more equal society when also uh, women and men's rights are are respected on the same on the same uh, level. So I think there's a lot a lot of job um, ahead of us as Greens and also ahead of the whole European Union if we want uh, to develop the European project and and use the pandemia, let's say the situation after pandemia to create new vision of the community. Okay, thanks very much, uh, Joanna. You also are mentioning uh, a statement uh, on solidarity in this uh, moment. Uh, we will share it on uh, our chat. Maybe you can explain it. Yeah, I mean, it's essential and it's a, a recurring theme from our members as well. This is not the time for Europe to retreat, but for Europe to step up and, um, and to show solidarity across the continent. And that means amongst and between people, member states and in and civil society as well um we had um in, when, and particularly i think one of the things that re is recurring is around the need for european action when it comes to looking at the stimulus packages when it look, comes to looking at the green new deal we're not going to solve the climate uh, the climate catastrophe we're not going to solve the um crisis of inequality between women and men we're not going to solve uh, the massive issues of inequality and poverty in Europe unless we look, we, we take those challenges together and we work together to find those, uh, those solutions. And where we see opportunities for that transformation to happen. So yes, we need solidarity between and amongst countries, absolutely essential. And there's a lot of scars, I think, from the, from the response to the, um, to the financial crisis and how that impacted, particularly in in southern and eastern Europe, um, but I think more more widely we've seen that that has been a political, social, and economic disaster. So we don't want to have that. So we need to pool our resources, our financial and our intellectual and our political resources, to have a more a, a Europe that's really built on solidarity and care and sharing. And it will be beneficial bene, beneficial to everybody in the end. So the joint statement, which I hope you'll share, is a statement that we did with the trade unions with the environmental NGOs, with some human rights and democracy NGOs, uh, with the women's movement, with I, I, more than 50 organizations who signed that. And it's really a call to the European Union leaders to act in solidarity, to build a, a, a Europe that's built on, uh, that's green, that's feminist, that's, that's uh, built on solidarity and social justice. And it sets out some recommendations and some demands in it that people can sort of short statement. Uh, and we shared that widely last week ahead of ahead of the uh, of the summit. Um, and I wanted to say uh, a moment of solidarity on Friday. It is the first of May, which is um, the International Labour Day. Uh, some of us have a day off in our homes, um, but I think also it's important, as other people have said, that there is solidarity amongst workers, whatever that work is. Um, and specifically looking at women workers and women in the labour market and outside the labour market. And I think it's really a moment to value the women at the forefront of fighting this, um, this pandemic, the women who are really doing the essential work uh, 
um, and make sure that, that we don't forget those women when we are building uh, a new Europe uh, for after this after this pandemic is over, but that we actually celebrate and value that work that women are doing now uh, right into the future as part of what we build together for the future of Europe. Okay, I think we all agree that this is the moment to uh, build a new Europe. Um, as always, the time has gone faster than thought, so we are coming to the end of this uh, Green Post Corner Talk. And I have a last question for the three speakers. And my question is, if you would do a recommendation for a feminist reader, uh, what kind of article, book author, or also maybe a person of a TikTok, would you recommend? Where do you find the inspiration? Uh, where do you find your inspiration? So, uh, may I ask Laura? Has uh, published an interesting book. Uh, it's a Joan Herrera book. He, uh, I don't remember now the title, but just a moment because I will say you before we go. Okay. No problem. Maybe then uh, Margot Zata. Uh, I guess the the main like message for all the feminists and for all the women is like just keep fighting, yeah, because there's so many issues we should still fight for, yeah. In Poland, it's not only like uh, fight abortion ban, but we have to fight for the liberalization of the abortion law. Uh, all, all over the Europe and in the world, we have to fight for the uh, better salary or equal salary, better uh, better division of the. Uh, of the um, home responsibilities and about the inspiration i think the contact with the women that are fighters yeah and the women's solidarity it personally inspires me the most yeah, i'm a member of few uh, feminist associations and the meetings we have the support we have from each other even in like a personal problems health problems uh, and the, the response and and the, the, this this, the will to help uh, and stay together it's something what is the best motivation to keep fighting okay thanks laura can we return to you book so i think that it would be a good idea to can um have uh wide perspective from different feminism so it's a joan herrera book it was published so, uh, some months ago and it's fraternity and ecology i don't know if it is published in english uh it is published in spanish uh yeah so fraternity and ecology fraternidad y ecología by joan herrera okay thank you so joanna yeah, I'd really join what uh, Malagrazata said. The inspiration comes from those women who are uh, organizing, are mobilizing, are uh, fighting for our rights day in, day out. Those women who are working, supporting women, uh, survivors of, uh, of violence, male violence. Those women who are supporting uh, women, ex women and girls exploited in prostitution to, um, to Get themselves out of that situation and supporting them in living a dignified life those women who are fighting for equal pay the trade union women who are like, fighting within their own movements as well to make sure that women's concerns and women's work um is is respected the women with disabilities and those who organize for the rights of women with disabilities those um who organize for the rights of migrant women and to make sure that their voices are heard and recognized so there's and i think we can get that inspiration through we're we're privileged in our in our jobs day to day but also um it's also possible to to engage with uh with those through social media through debates like this much more than it used to be even 10 years ago so i think there's a kind of such a wealth of of inspiration and ideas about how we want to go forward and um and transform I wanted to recommend one book, which I've come back to a few times, which is uh, by an American writer called Rebecca Solnit. And she has written some, she writes great essays basically on issues around the climate and around feminism. And uh, she particularly talks a lot about the power of protest 
And the, the reason, the need for protest and demand, even when it feels completely hopeless and useless. So her whole message is one of, of hope and how we draw hope in order to uh, fuel our action and our demand for change and how we can learn from history that sometimes an action that felt or seemed a little bit futile at the time then grows into something that actually transforms the planet. And I think at times like this, we all need a little bit of extra, extra hope. She was also the person who um, came up with the expression mansplaining, uh, which I think all the women of the world heard that and suddenly felt they'd been heard and seen and understood. So she's called Rebecca Solnit. She's written many fantastic books and she writes also uh, regularly in, um, in newspapers and so on. But the, the book she wrote, I think in 2003, uh, is called Hope in the Dark. And it's a really, it's a short book and it's really kind of uplifting when you're when you're living through times of particularly global crisis like this. Okay. So thank you. Uh, well, she's one of my favorites, so uh, I can only uh, join you in this recommendation. Uh, we've come to the end of this third session. I really want to thank you, all three of you. I think it was marvelous to have these different perspectives from different countries. Uh, Spain, Poland, and then also this uh, look at European policies. I think it really gave us insight and also uh, concrete proposals to have these more transformative policies. And so if you enjoyed this talk, please consider us supporting us and uh, supporting us for putting together more talks in the coming weeks by making a donation. And the link will be Posted now by the Jeff team in the chat. And so already for next week, we have another great session planned. It's about the future of our food system, the situation of our agriculture at this time. And as key speaker, we have uh, Olivier de Schutter. So please, if you appreciated this session, can you make a donation and join us again next week, Wednesday at two o'clock. Thank you very much.